So thanks, Peter. So hello, everyone. My name is Lucas Aguiar. I'm from the Regir team that achieved the second place in the machine learning methodology prediction competition. So today I'll present to you how we achieved this, this position, uh, showing the main steps from our workflow. In this presentation named Petrophysical Guided Preconditioning Applied to Electrophysics Classification by Machine Learning. Here's just a script of my presentation. First, I'll introduce you the Regir team members and the importance of this competition for us. Then I'll show you the main steps from our workflow, like how we handle these anomalous values or missing data. I also show you some step of sampling removal and two attribute generation steps. The first one is the wavelet transform and the second one is the feature augmentation. Uh, I'll also show you some training test strategy and a post processing method. I think someone's mix is is on, but it's okay. And then finally, I will show you some fascist prediction and a confusion matrix. So here, these are the members of the GIR team. GIR is a research lab from North Fluminense State University located in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. We work mainly with reservoir characterization. So here, as you can see me as the only geologist of the group. Uh, Mauricio as our petroleum engineer and our two geophysicists, uh, Jadson and Rodrigo. So as you can see, we have a multidisciplinary group, which was, was really important to us that can, we came with some different ideas and approaches. And we have been studying machine learning for just two years now. So, and we participate in this competition in the middle of several tasks like of the lab, like uh, reports and paper writing, so we are very glad that we could, we could achieve such a position. Here is just to contextualize, the main goal of the competition was to classify electrophysics of somewhere else from offshore Norway in the North Sea. And there was 90, 98 wells as training data and 10 wells as open test data and another 10 as closed test data. And the organization used a relative penetration matrix with geological character as a performance metric. This type of contest is very important for us. When I mean us, I mean everyone here, because now we have available data, well data to perform future tests. Our codes, our results, and this data will become reference for future researches and papers. Uh, as the case of the last competition, of the same type organized by SCG in 2016. And of course, there will be an open source repository for InterCD users. So to begin with our workflow, uh, we know that a prior analysis of our data is essential to succeed in our machine learning application. So first we try to find some washout regions. Washout is basically where there is the enlargement area of the well bore. So here, for example, if you see this drilling mud located in this region here, this may be uh, maybe modify the well log measurements of this area and will not translate the information of the rocks here. There are some logs that can help us identify these regions as the differential caliper and the density correction log, correction log. And in normal situation, these values tend to be close to zero, as you see here. And if they vary a lot from that, then maybe you're facing a washout problem. So in this case, we set to one limit, uh, two limits actually, a minimum limit and a maximum limit for each of these logs. And then we remove the samples above that limit, beyond that limit. And we also try to find some anomalous values because with petrophysical knowledge, you know that these highlighted areas here, they are not very common values for these properties as these very negative values for SP log or negative values for resistivity logs. And here it's not so ideal to simply remove these values as these samples are because they could have important information in other logs. So here we converted these values, for example, these resistivity logs to a minimal value like zero. And these uh, SP values for uh, a new value or uh, a missing data, which bring us to the next 
step that is I will show you how we handle this missing data. Uh, because as I said before, we don't want to remove these samples because we don't want to lose important information. So we recommend to perform an imputation and this imputation should be done for a, sorry, the imputation is basically to estimate values in these regions where there is missing data. So we recommend to use a regressor and then use information of what of other logs. So here, for example, we made a statistical correlation between all these logs. And then manually selected the logs that had the highest absolute correlation with the target. So, for example, here we can see our target is the neutral porosity log. Then we selected the top three most uh, highest absolute correlated uh, features or logs with it. So, for example, here we can see we'll pick the density log and the two sonic logs, the DTC and the DTS. Um, so basically, in general, we created 20 regression models, one, uh, one for each of these logs here, and the algorithm we chose was the exatrice. Another main, main precondition step we used was the shoulder effect removal that has a, a high geological character. Let's suppose you, you're looking, you're facing a testimony like this one in front of you. So here you can see the exact transition from one rock to another, like in a millimeter scale. And this is not what happens when you look at the well log scale, because here you have a sampling height of about 15.2 centimeters. So in this case, you maybe accumulate false information of rock transition. For example, where you see here as shale, it actually could be a sandstone in the real scale. So then we decided to remove one sample above and one sample below each rock transition. And that added more reliable information and robustness to, to our model. Another very important precondition step is the where you generate some attributes. First, we use the wavelet transform as a tool for mood scale analysis of well logs, um, mainly to separate fashes that were being confused. So this tool analyzes the signal spectrum in order to search for information about the oscillation of the signal pattern. The signal, in this case, it is, we chose the gamma ray lock. Uh, we did that because there was some confusion between some flashes, mainly between shale and, and sandy shale. So in a way, the signal spectrum through this transform helped us to better define uh, regions that this fascist transition occurs. So as you can see here, there is there are these anomalies, mainly on the transition from for shale to another fascist. Uh, and we then, what did we do? We selected three attributes from this transform, one at the beginning, one in the middle, one in the end of this uh, power scale gram. Then we selected more three attributes with the same range on this phase spectrum here. This was something that we tried at the very end of the competition, but it really helped us. But I'm sure with more time, we could uh, get more information about it. We also performed some feature augmentation that was adapted adapted from Mr. Gini and others from 2017. I think probably Vincenzo uh, is always uh, participate in this, in this paper. So basically here we create new features from mathematical combinations. Uh, we use these two techniques, the augmentation by gradient, summarized by this equation here, and also a polynomial transformation summarized by this one here, something that we got from the scikit learning library, a method called polynomial features. So basically the idea here is to create new features on the top of the existing ones to better separate classes in a, in a bigger space, in an augmented space. So here as you can see that maybe in some new uh, features combinations, we may now separate fashes more clearly, or if I could say so, more linearly. We chose the XGBoost as our classification algorithm. XGBoost uses a sample of decision trees to make the choices. It creates simple models like this one here. here. Uh, but each model has a limited predictive ability. 
but they uh, when they are used together for boosting they can generate more accurate models so here basically each model tries to correct the errors present in the previous one um, and then this process continues until uh, the classification is made correctly or a maximum number of models are added and XGBoost has been standing out in several machine learning competitions, so I'm sure that many of the competitors here also use it. And for training test strategies, we decided to choose a reduced data uh, to work so that we could simulate the training data without, without losing representation and perform faster tests as the training data had more than 1 million samples. And this learning curve helped us to define that ideal number. As you can see here, this blue curve represents the classification of the training data applied to itself. So you see that the accuracy decreases as the number of samples increases. And the green curve represents the cross validation on the training data. So the accuracy increases as the number of samples increases until, until it reaches a stable level. So here you can see that these two curves tend to converge. So adding more samples here is very unlikely to help to, to improve the model performance for tests. So in this case, we selected then an amount of more or less 100,000 samples, as you can see here, for testing our models, since the precision gain with more samples here should be small. And this helped us to save some computation time and to get um, to help us to get faster responses. The reason we tried this approach was because cross-validation didn't work too well for us. The improvements we saw in cross-validation didn't have the same effect on, on the open test data from the competition. So here we selected a reduced data set with about 100,000 samples, as that was the number from the learning curve. Selected 10 wells, as training data and five worlds as validation data. And we chose them to have a good re spatial representation in the area, as you can see here, this blue and red dots. And then all the preconditioned steps and new attempts, attempts were applied on top of this data until we improved as much as we could. And then we used these steps uh, that worked better on the real data. So here, basically, we try many different preconditioned steps combinations until we reach our uh, top performance, as you can see here, the, the top accuracy and penalty score. After that, we select the, these um, better precondition steps and then apply it back on that original training data, that one with more than 1 million samples. There is also a post-processing method, something that is done after the prediction that we call the predicted fastest refinement. I think uh, Vincenzo showed something similar during the median feature of this prediction. So we know that it is unlikely that a single sample inferred between samples of a different flashes will be classified correctly. Uh, as we studied the data, we saw that there was like a pattern package, right? Because here you can see that there is a package of sand, then a package of limestone, then a package of sand again. So if there was just one or two alone samples inside one of these package, we then converted that sample to the number of flashes, and that was something that helped us in the end. Here uh, is our fastest prediction on the closed test data, the data that gave us the second position, with where we got this score of minus 0 0.47. We can see that in general, there is a very good similarity of these flashes. Uh, on the left, there are the real flashes, and on the right, the predicted one. So here, I think we could say that our model uh, managed to generalize well for this new data after the training. And to the result not to be so subjective, I'll also like to show you some uh, confusion matrix we have made. I hope you all understand how this confusion matrix works. Matrix works, but uh, so here basically we can see that we have uh, overall good accuracy. Uh, our accuracy was around 80%, which I think it's a good a good precision for such a, a big data. 
we can say that there is a high precision less common flashes, as for example, anhydrite and halite. There are also a high precision for shale, uh, which is really good as shale is the most common flashes, as you can see here, all these dark green flashes is shale. And the negative point is that there is confusion between shale and other fascists, but uh, it's, it is understandable as there was a lot of shale in our training data. We tried some resampling strategies, but they didn't work too well for us. And there is also confusion between carbonate fascists like limestone chalk and mar, for example. But uh, I would say that it is also understandable as they have very similar properties. So just to conclude, a, a general conclusion, we know that now there is time optimization with this kind of automated tasks that will help geoscience with these machine learning applications. Uh, there is a possibility of high precision in these applications. We know now that it is important to analyze our data to know how to get the best out of it. And process your data it is as essential as we saw here. And of course, having a bag of multidisciplinary knowledge can help you a lot. So I'd like to thank all the organizers of the, this competition. I'd like to thank G Lab to let us participate in this, this competition and Petrobras for founding our project there. So that is it. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, are there any questions? I have a question. Uh, I, you used a somewhat sophisticated um, imputation technique, the 20 model uh, ensemble. Um, and a lot of the competitors in, in this, at least the ones that submitted the mid course final scoring did not use such a sophisticated approach. Did you see any like fair score improvements using this compared to more naive approaches? I mean, a lot of people just uh, replacing missing values with uh, zero, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we tried to replace these values with like zero, for example, or just to let it as a new value. But it didn't work too well for us. And this kind of imputation has, as I could say, a geological character because you a geological and a statistical character. As you are using some logs that can, for example, that can tell about the information of the composition of the rock, of the texture or the structure. So you're using related logs to perform that imputation as a regression. The same situation as in no AFI. If you want to estimate a porosity log, then you use information of other logs to perform that imputation. So we tried to do something like that, and for us it worked better. And and you also clear improvements, you would say, uh, using such an approach. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. The bad the bad thing is that. You perform an imputation for such a big data, so so you have to so you lose some computational time. I would say it can it can take too long, right? But after you have done the imputation, you can follow on. Thank you, Lucas. Just a quick question: What do you think uh, is the most critical point? Uh, in your uh, for 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 the classification task of lithophages, what do you think give you uh, the most important improvement in your model? Yeah, that's a difficult difficult question, right? Because here in this type of competition, we are talking about uh, as you saw in the final rank, our our scores were very similar. But I would say the definite delay imputation is a is one critical step that we used. The attribute generator generation also was very important. I think I would say those two. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome.
Um, hello, can I ask a question, please? Uh, hello, Lucas. Hello. Uh, I, I found that CWT features that you're generating is very interesting, and you mentioned that you only use three uh, out of it, yeah, uh, the low, mid, and high uh, one. Have you yeah. ever tried to use more features than three, for example, like the whole features, and how how does it perform? Is it better or not, not getting better? Thank you very much. Okay. Actually, we try with just one of the feature, one attribute from that transform. Uh, we had a bad result, a uh, good result, but it was it wasn't best, better than this, this final one. But the bad thing is that we made it this way with transform, and then we made some feature augmentation. So our feature augmentation like multiplied the feature that we had before. So if we used all those features from where we transform, then we would have a, a model with so many features and we couldn't uh, give that to the to the competition. But it's something that we, of course we need to study it more because it can generate very accurate results. All right, thank you very much. Welcome.